I entered the restaurant and scanned the room. In the corner, I spotted my ex-wife, but her husband was nowhere to be seen. It had been a decade since our divorce, and being around her still unsettled me. Despite my hesitation, I ultimately chose to confront her. I could only hope it wasn't a mistake. She looked well, though time had begun to show its effects. She seemed visibly nervous, triggering memories of our marriage's collapse years ago, a period of therapy and struggle to regain my equilibrium, starting from a visit to the medical clinic. Mr. Williams, your report is ready, the receptionist called out. Lost in a fog of emotions, I barely registered her voice. I mechanically approached the counter, signed the charge slip, and received the ominous envelope. I held it paralyzed by dread. Plain and unassuming, it bore only my name, Justin Williams. Yet, I knew its contents could shatter my world. Numbly, I crossed the street to a park, finding solace on a secluded bench. Oblivious to the drizzle and the wet seat, I focused solely on the envelope. With trembling hands, I tore it open. The dense jargon of the DNA test report bewildered me, but its stark revelation pierced through. I was not the biological father of my children, Jennifer and Todd. It took several readings to absorb the truth. After 17 years of marriage, my entire life felt like a deception. I crumbled, tears streaming down my face. Amber and I had married hastily, perhaps influenced by circumstances. She had been involved with Jimmy Swanson throughout high school, a decent guy and former football quarterback, though our team rarely triumphed. I was the starting middle linebacker, witnessing both our team's struggles and brief moments of glory. In our senior year, we unexpectedly clinched a regional championship, despite Jimmy's poor performance in the crucial game. But our joy was short-lived as we were swiftly defeated in the divisional round. Jimmy and Amber split before graduation, and he later left for the military, occasionally returning until settling back in town after nine years of service. After our graduation ceremony, I attended one of the parties celebrating our high school liberation when I unexpectedly encountered Amber. She approached me, and before I knew it, we were intimate. At the time, I saw it as a fleeting opportunity that my impulses couldn't resist. I never anticipated it would lead to more. For weeks later, at Pizza Shack, Amber confronted me with news that changed everything. She was pregnant, and I was the father. Confused and unsure, I turned to my father for advice. It was a tough conversation. He was disappointed but urged me to do the right thing. And so, despite our youth, both 18, we married hastily, eloping to another state to avoid the scrutiny of Amber's conservative, old-money parents. Amber's parents, Fred and Janice Burton, eventually warmed to our marriage after initial reservations. Fred, especially, grew fond of me and considered me the son he never had. Tragically, they passed away in a car accident five years into our marriage, leaving us devastated. Married life with Amber wasn't always easy. She could be demanding and moody, and her way of expressing displeasure sometimes included withholding intimacy for extended periods. Despite this, I was naive and deeply in love, believing this was normal and that Amber cared for me in her own complex manner. There were moments when the strain reached breaking point and I would mention divorce, which sometimes led to temporary improvements. Before I got married, my plans to attend Florida State University were set aside. Instead, I enrolled in a local college, focusing on business administration and marketing. To make ends meet, my father employed me in his successful mail-order business, which specialized in high-end camping and fishing gear. Starting from the bottom, my father paid me enough to support us. Amber, initially reluctant to work, eventually took a job as a real estate salesperson after our son Todd began preschool. However, her earnings were modest, and real estate seemed more of a pastime than a serious career. Meanwhile, I steadily progressed in my father's company, handling the bills and witnessing Amber's lack of motivation. Sitting on that park bench, the truth hit me like a ton of bricks. I had been deceived years ago. I realized in an instant that Jimmy Swanson was the biological father of my children. What perplexed me was why Amber stayed with me. Perhaps it began with embarrassment over an unwed pregnancy, fearing her parents' reaction. But after Jennifer's birth, she could have divorced me without much consequence from her family. The fact that she bore another child with Jimmy three years later crushed me, hinting at deeper layers of deception. Are you all right? A voice interrupted my thoughts. 
Looking up, I saw Officer Sullivan, a policeman in a raincoat, standing nearby. He sat down beside me, offering a sympathetic ear. I hesitated briefly before deciding to confide in him. With tears wiped away, I shared my discovery of Amber's infidelity and the heartbreaking truth about my children not being biologically mine. Wow, he said, his voice filled with disbelief, and I thought my ex-wife was the most heartless person alive. After our divorce, I found out she had been cheating on me since our wedding day. She was careful about it, but whenever she wanted someone, she took them. I was married to her for five years before I finally caught on. I walked in on her with a detective from my own precinct in the act. Detective Peterson tried to escape through the window, but I grabbed him by the hair and brought him back, breaking his nose on the floor. Blood everywhere, and all she did was smirk from the bed. That's when I knew I had to get out before I did something I'd regret. What happened next? I asked, momentarily distracted from my own pain. I called my captain, explained what I found, and what I did. He sent officers to pick me up and deal with Peterson. The next day, I was transferred across town until things settled down and they handled Peterson. How did they handle him? After everything settled, my wife fled with a check for our savings, but she didn't notice it wasn't signed. She rushed out because my colleagues warned her I was out for her with my service weapon. She spent weeks trying to get someone to sign it, but our accounts were frozen. Peterson ended up resigning when he realized the department had closed ranks against him. I divorced my wife and made sure she had to fight for every cent. Last I heard, she's in California with the rest of the cheaters. The officer's tale didn't lessen my pain, but it did provide a brief release. Here's my advice, Officer Sullivan said suddenly. Don't do anything rash. I know you might want to hurt your wife or yourself, but don't. Time and distance heal most heartaches. After Officer Sullivan left, I reflected on his words. Confronting Amber in my current state seemed impossible. My father had been urging me to visit Midwest manufacturers for our camping equipment business, a trip I'd delayed due to the weather. Now, I resolved to make that journey. I called my dad, swiftly packed, and was relieved Amber wasn't home. Leaving a vague voicemail about a sudden business trip, I anticipated she wouldn't care much. True to form, she didn't call until the third day, and I let it go to voicemail. By the time I arrived home, I had managed to compose myself and think things through. Despite the overwhelming hurt, I remained outwardly calm. As I entered, I heard Amber moving about in the den. She came out casually and tried to kiss me, but I pushed her away. We need to talk, I said firmly, grabbing a beer from the fridge and sitting down at the kitchen table. Okay, Amber replied cautiously, what do we need to talk about? I want a divorce, I stated bluntly. She stared at me silently for a moment, then sighed. Well, it doesn't really matter now. I guess you found out about Jimmy and me. I figured you might, especially after that business trip. I also found out that Jennifer and Todd aren't my children, I added sharply. Her face paled momentarily, but then a smirk played on her lips. I'm sorry you found out, but that doesn't change things now. I widened my eyes in disbelief and shook my head. I don't even know what to make of what you just said. Are you sorry you got caught? Are you sorry for sleeping with Jimmy and having his children? Or are you just sorry that I discovered your deceit? Are you sorry that I'm a fool who loved you? What exactly are you sorry about? Amber showed no sign of remorse. No, I'm just sorry you found out about the kids. My plan was to divorce you after my 35th birthday next week. I was going to tell you I wasn't in love with you anymore. After some time, I'd start dating Jimmy, and eventually, we'd marry. Then, when the time was right, I'd explain everything to the kids. They'd understand and accept Jimmy as their real father. What's so significant about your 35th birthday? I asked, still trying to grasp everything. I never told you, but my grandparents set up trusts for my sisters and me. Each trust was worth $7 million. The condition was that we had to marry by 25 and still be married by 35 to receive the funds outright. My sisters moved away after getting married and kept their trust secret to avoid complicating things with their husbands. I asked them not to tell us about the trusts, and they agreed. 
Why didn't you just marry Jimmy then? My grandparents were traditional. According to the trust, my parents had to approve of my spouse. My father dislikes Jimmy. Knowing your parents were friends with mine, I thought they wouldn't object to you. I was boiling with rage inside. Seventeen years of my life had been wasted by Amber's deception. She cheated me out of my children and manipulated everyone for her grandparents' money. She was beyond heartless. As much as I wanted to lash out physically, I knew it would only backfire. During my time away, I had educated myself on divorce proceedings enough to understand that violence would only make matters worse. Well, Amber, congratulations on achieving your goal, I sneered. Even if I started divorce proceedings tomorrow, we wouldn't be divorced before your 35th birthday. You've really shown your true colors, you cold-hearted woman. Amber smirked in response. Despite the temptation to retaliate physically, I struggled to maintain my composure. Since you've been unfaithful and deceitful, I will begin divorce proceedings tomorrow, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. If name-calling helps you cope, Justin, go ahead, Amber retorted with an eye roll. But let's try to handle this as civilly as possible. A swift and quiet divorce would be best for everyone. I stepped closer to her, unable to contain my anger. Fuck you, I spat, then stepped back, feeling a surge of bitterness. You can hate me all you want, Amber said smugly. I'm going to marry Jimmy, and there's nothing you can do about it. Besides, we have to think about the kids. What about the kids? I demanded. You're not going to go around telling everyone you're not their father, are you? Amber asked tentatively. I mean, you wouldn't want people to think you're a cuckold. I chuckled bitterly. By the old definition, maybe I am one, a cuckold who raises another's offspring. But whether it's old-fashioned or modern, the disgrace is on the cheating spouse, not the faithful partner. I don't care if people think I'm a cuckold. The kids deserve to know the truth. That's typical of you, Justin. You'd sacrifice your kids because your fragile male ego got hurt, Amber shot back angrily. I'm not going to tell them, I smirked darkly. You're going to tell them, and I'll be there to witness it. And if you refuse, I'll make sure they see pictures of you and Jimmy in action. Your call. I had no such pictures, but Amber didn't know that. She must have been wondering how I discovered her affair. The truth was, I initially suspected paternity issues due to Todd's blood type not matching mine, a positive versus B positive. My investigation led me to have DNA tests done. Amber erupted in anger and threatened to retaliate publicly. However, I insisted that I would talk to the kids with or without her, so we eventually gathered in the kitchen to break the news. The next day, we waited anxiously as Jennifer and Todd returned home from school. Kids, come into the kitchen. Your mother and I need to talk to you, I called out as they entered the front door. Jennifer and Todd sat down, clearly bewildered. They glanced between their mother and me, unsure of what was happening. There's no easy way to say this, Amber began, twisting a paper napkin in her hands, but your father and I are getting a divorce. The kids reacted strongly, and I had to calm them down. Let your mother finish, and then we'll discuss it. It's nobody's fault, Amber tried to continue, but I slammed my hand on the table to stop her. For God's sake, Amber, I see that. Since you won't tell them the truth, I will. You're old enough to understand. But first, know that I love you both unconditionally, regardless of what your mother feels. You jerk, Amber snapped back. You know I love our children just as much as you do. Yeah, sure, I scoffed at my soon-to-be ex-wife, then turned to my kids, seeing fear in their eyes. Your mother cheated on me, and I'm divorcing her because of it. But there's more you need to know. You're being such a bastard about this, Justin, Amber retorted. This is difficult for me too, I said, my heart breaking. But while your mother was unfaithful, she had both of you with her lover. I'm not your biological father, Jimmy Swanson is. The kids were silent, tears streaming down their faces. It tore me apart to see them in such pain, but I believed it was better they heard the truth from us than from town gossip. Why, Mom? Jennifer asked through her tears. Why would you do this to Dad, to us? Amber glared at me, then turned to her daughter. Because I love Jimmy Swanson. 
Let's tell them everything, I said with disgust for Amber. Your mother stands to inherit $7 million when she turns 35, as long as she remains married, which she will be. She couldn't marry Jimmy earlier because her grandparents disapproved. According to the trust, she would lose the inheritance if she married against their wishes. Todd was sobbing now, and Jennifer had risen from her seat, confronting her mother. You did all of this for money? You destroyed our family for money? Jennifer cried out, slapping her mother across the face. She lunged forward, knocking Amber to the floor and continued hitting her. I had anticipated a difficult conversation, but never expected it to turn violent. It took all my strength to restrain my daughter, who was only a hundred pounds. After guiding Jennifer to the living room and instructing her to sit on the couch, I returned to check on Amber. She was slowly getting up, blood streaming from her nose and lip. I hope you're proud of yourself, Justin, Amber spat angrily. You've really messed up your kids. Don't you dare blame my dad for this mess, you bitch. Jennifer screamed as she stormed back into the kitchen. If you say one more bad word about daddy, I'll scratch your eyes out. Amber backed away from her daughter, visibly stunned and a little scared. Amber, I think it would be best if you found somewhere else to stay for the next few days, I interjected, trying to maintain calm. At least until things calm down. Amber, unhappy but recognizing the tension, went off to pack a bag. Just before she left, she stuck her head back into the kitchen. It's okay, kids, I still love you. If looks could kill, Jennifer's glare would have floored her mother. Amber wisely chose to leave. It took hours to settle the kids down. Todd was still tearful when he went to bed that night, and Jennifer was visibly shaken. Daddy, Jennifer asked later while we were still in the kitchen, will you still be our dad? I'd be devastated if I lost you. Honey, you'll be 18 soon, I reassured her. Then you can decide what you want to do. Legally, I might not have parental rights, but one thing is clear, you will always be my daughter, and I will always love you. Jennifer managed a brave smile before I kissed her goodnight. Then I went to Todd's room. He had stopped crying but looked utterly miserable. That night, sleep eluded us all. I lay awake, questioning my decision to confront the kids. Yet, I couldn't see a better way to handle the situation. I knew they'd react badly. They'd always been closer to me than to their mother. Jennifer was my little princess, and Todd and I shared many interests. Another thought nagged at me. All those trips to visit her sisters had been excuses to see Jimmy. After our confrontation, Amber and Jimmy went public with their relationship. Amber showed no remorse, blaming everyone but herself. It was her grandparents' fault for the trust conditions, her parents' fault for disliking Jimmy, and mine for not being the husband she needed. She spun a story about me being distant, justifying her affair. Of course, she omitted the truth about our children not being mine. Most of our friends viewed her with disbelief and suspicion. After hearing the stories, my anger intensified beyond what I felt initially upon discovering the truth. I found myself consumed with thoughts of revenge against Amber and Jimmy. It's a primal urge, especially for a man, to want retribution against a cheating spouse and their lover. However, upon reflection, I realized that my ire was primarily directed at Amber. Jimmy, in contrast, seemed like a simple guy caught up in the situation, good-looking and pleasant, but not the orchestrator of it all. Despite my anger, I couldn't bring myself to reveal to everyone that Jennifer and Todd weren't biologically mine. The thought of the potential harm it could cause my children was unbearable. They were my kids in every way that mattered to me, and I vowed to always think of them as such. As days turned into weeks, I fell into a deep depression. My world had been shattered, and the only things keeping me grounded were my work and my children. After the disastrous confrontation between Amber and the kids, they stayed with me, becoming the sole bright spots in my life. Throughout the divorce proceedings, Amber wisely avoided pushing for custody, though she attempted to reconnect with Jennifer and Todd. Amber's attempts to contact Jennifer soon ceased after a series of bitter exchanges that left Jennifer seething with anger. Todd, on the other hand, spoke with his mother but was visibly affected afterward. Recognizing that all three of us needed help coping, I arranged counseling sessions with family therapist Mary Chaser. 
Mary suggested sessions together and individually, urging Amber's participation. Surprisingly, Amber agreed, but the first joint session ended disastrously when Amber's insensitive remark provoked Jennifer to the point of aggression. I insisted to Mary that future sessions exclude Amber if she wanted us to continue attending, a decision Mary supported. Despite the counseling, a pervasive fear gripped me, what if the court decided against me, denying visitation with my children? The thought haunted me for weeks, worsening my depression until Mary prescribed antidepressants, which offered some relief. Initially, the counseling seemed ineffectual, but over time, I started to improve. Though thoughts of revenge still simmered, Mary warned me that any rash actions could jeopardize my custody rights. As the final divorce hearing approached, tensions escalated. The courtroom atmosphere was tense. The judge was clearly displeased with Amber after reviewing the case. Amber's attorney was unhelpful, while my lawyer seemed more interested in antagonizing his counterpart than advocating for me. However, it was Jennifer's courageous testimony that, coupled with the judge's decisive ruling, delivered the final blows in court. The entire courtroom drama laid bare for everyone Amber's true nature, selfish and cold-hearted. Despite gaining access to her trust fund, which had grown substantially, Amber sought to extract her share from me, half of the marital assets, the house, alimony, and half of my 401k. My lawyer did a decent job of exposing Amber's deceit, painting me as a devoted husband and father. However, the judge swiftly redirected him when he attempted to idealize me. Nonetheless, his final plea was poignant and logical, urging the court not to reward Amber's deception. Then the contentious issue of custody arose. Amber insisted on full custody of the children with minimal visitation for me, likely believing I was to blame for the strained relationship with our kids. Her attorney probably cautioned her against seeking to sever my rights entirely, as it would reflect poorly in court. On the contrary, I sought full custody with generous visitation rights for Amber, though my lawyer cautioned me not to get my hopes up. Before custody deliberations began, the judge asked if the children preferred to speak privately in chambers. Jennifer immediately declined, asserting her desire for her statement to be on record. Jennifer bravely approached the lectern, visibly nervous but determined. She glanced at Amber with defiance before turning to me with a smile and silently mouthing, I love you. Then, she composed herself and addressed Amber as Mrs. Swanson, causing Amber to visibly tense. I want to address my comments to you, Mrs. Swanson, Jennifer began firmly. Despite what my birth certificate says, I no longer consider you my mother. In my mind, my mother is dead to me. I want nothing to do with you now or in the future. I turn 18 next year and will make my own decisions legally. You were never there for me growing up, so I won't be there for you. That's not true. Amber interjected. The judge promptly intervened, banging his gavel. Your attorney has presented your case. We are discussing custody, and I need to hear from the children. Do not interrupt again. Amber's face flushed crimson, and I couldn't discern if it was due to embarrassment or anger. I refocused on Jennifer, who continued, her voice steady despite the emotional weight of her words. When I was five, I colored a picture for you, Jennifer recounted, her voice trembling slightly. I waited eagerly all day for you to come home so I could give it to you. But when I did, you patted me on the head and criticized me for not coloring within the lines. Later, I found that picture discarded in the trash. Jennifer's face flushed red, and she took deep breaths, gathering herself to continue. When I was nine, the carnival came to town. Dad said we were all going. Todd and I were excited that we'd be together. But you canceled last minute. I guess you were with your lover. Dad took us, and we had a great time, but it hurt that you didn't want to be with me. When I was 12 and got my first period, you were away again. You always found reasons to be gone. Dad found me crying with blood on my pants. He comforted me, explained everything, and took me to get what I needed. When you came home and found out, you gave me pads and a book, then left. Dad was more of a mom than you ever were. These are just a few times you ignored me. Jennifer paused, wiping a tear and glaring at her mother. What you did to my father was cold, calculated, and selfish. To do that to a man who only wanted to love you cuts me to my core. What you've done to Todd and me is beyond reprehensible. 
I consider you beneath contempt. Turning to Jimmy, she lifted some dirt off the podium. As for you, Mr. Swanson, you may have contributed a speck of sperm to create Todd and me, but I care more for this piece of dirt than I do for you. Jennifer faced the judge squarely. If you make me live with her, there will be violence. To prevent that, with my grandfather's attorney, I've prepared a petition for emancipation. I want legal separation from that woman. I want to divorce the woman who calls herself my mother. Jennifer's bold statement surprised the judge, who accepted the petition and placed it with his other documents. Next, Todd nervously stepped forward. He disliked public speaking but understood he needed to speak up to share his perspective. I'm, I'm really nervous, Todd stammered, his voice shaky. I'm not good at speaking in public. But I have stories like Jan's about my mom neglecting us. I don't want to waste anyone's time. I just want to say I don't want to go live with that woman and that jerk. Todd paused, his cheeks turning red. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to say jerk, even though that's what I think of him. I can't even look at her without being totally disgusted. I want to stay with the only dad I've ever known. Please don't make me go live with them. Todd pointed toward his mother and Jimmy before returning to his seat. As Todd spoke, I observed Amber and Jimmy closely. Amber's face had flushed an even deeper shade of red, and she trembled visibly. Jimmy, typically easygoing, showed a flicker of anger when Todd insulted him. Amber seemed furious with her children, likely planning to blame me, but I felt agreement with everything they had expressed. Amber had clearly been far from an exemplary mother, and now the truth was out for all to see. Once the children had finished speaking, I expected the judge to adjourn to deliberate, but he surprised us all. Normally, I take a few days to consider both sides before making a decision. However, this case is so clear-cut that I can render my ruling. I glanced over at Amber and saw a thoroughly enraged woman. Clearly, this court hearing was not unfolding as she had envisioned. On my part, I was pleasantly surprised by the turn of events. I had heard countless horror stories of husbands getting the short end of the stick in divorce court. But everything changed the moment the judge ruled that there had never been a valid marriage between Amber and me. Now, regarding the question of custody, the judge continued, I understand that Jennifer and Todd are deeply emotional about this matter, and I must take that into account. In a traditional divorce scenario, Jennifer would be old enough to choose where she wishes to live. However, since Mr. Williams is not her biological father, and given the annulment of the marriage, I cannot award custody to him. Nevertheless, since Jennifer has already filed a petition for emancipation from her mother, I will allow her to reside with her grandparents if they are willing to take her in. Jennifer will be under their care until a decision is made on her petition for emancipation. In any case, in approximately a year's time, she will have the legal right to determine her residence independently. A quick glance at Amber surprised me. A tear was rolling down her cheek. Jennifer and Amber had never had a close relationship, especially in the last five years. I had chalked it up to Jennifer being a rebellious teenager, reminiscent of how my sister and mother clashed during her high school years. However, their situation was starkly different. Amber's betrayal of our family had severed any hope of reconciliation with her daughter, at least for the foreseeable future. As for the custody of Todd Williams, the judge stated with a grimace, I understand he is extremely upset with his mother and wishes to reside with Mr. Williams. Again, Mr. Williams does not have legal standing in this custody determination. Therefore, I am awarding custody to Mrs. Williams and recommending liberal visitation rights for Mr. Williams. However, this cannot be enforced by court order. Furthermore, since Todd will be residing with his mother, Mrs. Williams may remain in the house. However, Mr. Williams, beyond your obligation to the mortgage lender, I cannot compel you to make mortgage payments. The judge scanned the room briefly before concluding, unless there are any further matters, court is adjourned. Todd sprang to his feet so hastily that he knocked over his chair and stormed out of the room in tears. Amber stood up and shot me a furious glare as Jennifer came over and embraced me. I kissed Jennifer on the cheek and promised to take her and Todd out to lunch, pending Amber's approval for Todd to join us. Then I spoke with my attorney about challenging the judge's ruling on the house, but he advised against it. Instead, he suggested pressuring Amber to fulfill her financial obligations toward the property. 
If she refused, I would have to make the payments myself to avoid losing the substantial equity involved. Additionally, my attorney assured me that when the house was eventually sold, I could petition the court to reimburse me for any payments exceeding 50%. As we stepped into the hallway, I heard Todd shouting angrily at Amber and Jimmy. I approached Todd and urged him to calm down, instructing him to wait outside, which he did reluctantly. Amber turned her fury towards me. You think you've won, she jabbed a finger into my chest, but I got the house and the love of my life. As much as I thought Amber couldn't hurt me any further, her words cut deep. I wanted to lash out at her and confront Jimmy, but I summoned all my willpower to remain calm and smile. Would it be all right if Todd joins Jennifer and me for lunch? I asked politely. Fuck you, she hissed. No, Todd won't be seeing you today or ever. I won't have you corrupting him like you did to my daughter. If you believe that, then you're the most ignorant person on this planet, I snapped back, my self-control slipping. Hey, watch your mouth, Jimmy threatened. Jimmy, if you lay a hand on me, I'll beat the crap out of you, and you know I can do it. I suggest you back off, I warned sternly. Jimmy saw the intensity in my eyes and wisely decided not to escalate the situation. Once I was sure he wouldn't pose a threat, I turned back to my estranged wife and decided to confront her head on. Amber, you are without a doubt one of the most self-centered people I've ever encountered. Let me set a few things straight. First of all, you don't have a golden touch. Sex with you was mediocre at best, and then you got everything you wanted from your plaything. Furthermore, if I had the chance to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, I would do it again if it meant having the same kids. It's always been about the children for me. I was stuck with you as part of the package deal, but I love them more than anything. So, fuck you. I hope you have a miserable, wretched life. Exhausted after my outburst, I knew I had to leave before I completely lost control. I turned and walked out the door, ignoring Amber's insults calling me a pathetic loser and claiming I was nothing compared to Jimmy and that sex with me had been nauseating for her. Todd took the news of his mother refusing lunch with us badly. I apologized and explained that my hands were tied due to court decisions. He started to cry, pleading with me to take him along. Until that moment, I didn't think I could feel any worse, but I was wrong. I hugged him tightly, reassuring him that he had to go with his mother, but I promised I would never stop fighting to bring him back. The following six months were the most agonizing of my life. Anger, resentment, sadness, and deep depression consumed me. Amber appealed the court's division of assets, and I fought to overturn the trust she had received on behalf of the children. I argued that since the marriage was annulled, Amber hadn't fulfilled the trust's conditions. However, I lost both cases. The appeals court ruled that despite the annulment and my deception in marrying Amber, they considered her contribution to the household greater than 10%. They awarded her 40% of our joint assets, exempting my 401k. Regarding the trust, they decided that since Jennifer and Todd weren't specifically named, they had no legal standing. The court also upheld that since there was no marriage, I had no claim. They viewed our cohabitation as a form of common law marriage. As devastating as losing both court battles was, what frustrated me even more was my inability to exact any revenge on Amber or Jimmy. Seeing them together around town, acting like lovesick teenagers, holding hands, hugging, and kissing in public, was unbearable. It felt like they were everywhere I turned, reigniting the emotional turmoil each time. Unable to endure it any longer, I decided to move to a town 15 miles away. Luckily, due to the way school districts were set up, Jennifer didn't have to switch schools, and Todd remained with Amber. I tried my best to move on and put Amber out of my mind, but I couldn't escape the recurring nightmare. In the dream, Jimmy would be with Amber, taunting me, saying things like, Watch as I make your wife pregnant. I hardly slept and struggled to eat properly during those initial six months. The one silver lining was Todd. He became such a handful that Amber eventually called me to take him. It was one of the few moments of levity I experienced during that dark period. As Todd dashed out of the house towards my car, Amber and Jimmy appeared on the porch to bid him farewell. Surprisingly, tears streamed down Amber's cheeks while Jimmy appeared relieved. As Todd sprinted towards me, Amber called out, I love you. 
Todd didn't pause, but flicked his middle finger towards his mother and Jimmy. Amber broke down sobbing at this, which momentarily lifted my spirits. However, seeing Jimmy console Amber quickly turned my satisfaction into anger. I restrained myself and simply got back into the car to take Todd to my new place, arranging for him to continue attending the same school until the end of the year. I had rented a three-bedroom house with two baths, and having Jennifer and Todd with me was the only thing that prevented me from spiraling into complete madness. Despite my efforts to move forward, my desire for revenge against Amber and Jimmy continued to eat away at me. I couldn't conceive a plan that wouldn't land me in jail, though there were moments where I thought, fuck it, I'll just kill them, before dismissing such thoughts out of concern for my children's well-being. My children remained incredibly supportive, and I did my best to hold myself together for their sake. Jennifer stepped up admirably, taking on the responsibility of managing the household, cooking, cleaning, ensuring Todd attended school and completed his homework. She even made sure I ate and went to work. Nine months after the annulment, everything came crashing down. I suffered a severe panic attack at work, collapsing in my office and struggling to breathe. Coworkers feared it was a heart attack, and I was rushed to the hospital for extensive tests. Once it was diagnosed as a panic attack, I was strongly advised to see a therapist. Reluctant at first, I eventually agreed when my dad made it clear that my children's well-being depended on it. My therapist, and Summers, proved to be incredibly helpful. She explained that I was experiencing PTSD, similar to someone who had endured combat or suffered a profound loss, and guided me through the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. According to her, I had become stuck between anger and depression, unable to move forward due to the overwhelming sense of loss and betrayal inflicted by Amber. The panic attack I had experienced served as a stark warning of the toll this stress was taking on my health, potentially leading to dire consequences if left unchecked. While Anne's diagnosis resonated with me, I felt powerless about how to change my situation. Fortunately, she provided a solution. I was instructed to maintain a journal where I documented every negative thought I harbored towards Amber and Jimmy. At the end of each entry, I was to write, I forgive them. During our therapy sessions, I would read aloud these darkest thoughts about my ex-wife, and, and, and I would dissect them together. One particularly disturbing thought involved harming Jimmy, but through discussion, I acknowledged that I could never live with the guilt of such an act, especially considering how my children would perceive me if I were to commit such violence. The children became a focal point in my therapy, a reminder of what truly mattered. Slowly, I began to release much of my anger, and my life gradually improved. Around the same time, I noticed that Jennifer was struggling with her own deep-seated anger. She exhibited hostility towards almost everyone, including her grandfather at times. Upon my father's urging, I promptly arranged for both Jennifer and Todd to receive counseling. While Jennifer kept her sessions private, Todd eagerly shared his experiences with me. He expressed profound anger towards his mother, feeling abandoned and betrayed, particularly towards me. Yet, Todd revealed that Jennifer's resentment towards Amber far surpassed his own, leaving me deeply saddened. Two years after the annulment, Todd began reluctantly communicating with his mother, albeit in a reserved manner. Although Amber desired more, she appeared to appreciate even this minimal contact. In stark contrast, Jennifer adamantly refused any interaction with her mother. For years after the annulment, Jennifer got married. I encouraged her to invite Amber and Jimmy to the wedding, but she adamantly refused. Concerned about her lingering anger, I expressed my worries. Jennifer smiled gently and kissed me on the cheek. Dad, I'm not angry anymore. People think hate is the opposite of love, but it's not. Indifference is. I feel completely indifferent towards her. I simply don't care about what she does, says, or thinks. She ignored me and betrayed our family. I was angry, but now she's just someone I don't want in my life. Having her at my wedding would ruin it, so neither of them is coming. After Amber's betrayal, I never thought I'd remarry. However, a year before Jennifer's wedding, Jean Wilder, whom I'd been dating for over a year, pressed me to make a decision about marriage. She made it clear that she wanted a family and gave me an ultimatum. I chose to marry Jean, and it turned out to be the best decision of my life. Our wedding felt like a fresh start, 
finally laying to rest the demons of my past with Amber. Naturally, neither Jimmy nor Amber were invited to the wedding. The following three years were filled with happiness. Jennifer gave birth to a son, Justin, and 18 months later to a daughter, Christina. Amber was not allowed to visit Jennifer in the hospital, nor was she invited to the christenings, birthday parties, or any holidays. Jennifer had completely cut Amber out of her life. In the years that followed, I rarely saw Amber or Jimmy. When I did encounter them, it no longer triggered the intense emotional turmoil it once did. Like Jennifer, I had become indifferent towards Amber. However, Amber unexpectedly reached out to me, wanting to discuss the children. Despite my discomfort, I agreed to meet with her. I approached Amber's table cautiously. She looked at me hopefully, and I nodded before sliding into the booth across from her. You're looking well, Amber, I greeted her politely. Where's Jimmy? Amber's face flushed slightly. We're taking a break from each other for a while. I'm sorry to hear that, I replied, though I wasn't genuinely sorry. I was aware that Jimmy had left. He seemed to have thought he had it made when Amber inherited her wealth, but she grew tired of supporting him without him contributing financially. Whether he would return or not was of little concern to me. I simply wanted to get through the meeting. What did you want to talk about? I prompted. I heard you got married a while back, and you're expecting, she said with a tentative smile. Congratulations. Now you'll have a child of your own. I'll have three children, I corrected her sharply, feeling a surge of anger. Amber realized her mistake immediately. I'm sorry, that came out wrong. I didn't mean it that way. I meant to say that I'm happy for you, having a child with someone who loves you. I relaxed slightly, accepting her apology at face value. Again, what did you want to talk about? Justin, Amber began tearfully, it's tearing me apart that Jennifer won't see me or even talk to me. I haven't even met my grandchildren. I want to be a part of their lives. It was tempting to tell Amber that if she had been there for Jennifer earlier, things might be different now. But I bit my tongue and chose to take the high road. What exactly do you want me to do? I asked calmly. Jennifer listens to you, Amber said desperately. If you tell her to talk to me, she'll listen. For what it's worth, I've spoken to her, I explained. I tried to get her to invite you and Jimmy to the wedding, the christenings, birthday parties. I even suggested inviting you for Christmas at my house. Every time, Jennifer refused. She's made it clear she doesn't want you around. She hates me that much? Amber's voice wavered with despair. No, she doesn't hate you, I replied firmly. In her mind, you weren't there for her when she needed you, and now she's moved on. She's chosen her path, and she believes you chose yours. I've tried to change her mind, but it hasn't worked. I'm sorry. Amber began to cry softly, and I lightly patted her hand. I promise I'll keep trying. Maybe someday Jennifer will soften. I've made such a mess, Justin, Amber sobbed. I was selfish and cruel. I'm so sorry. I know it doesn't mean much now, but I am truly, truly sorry. Leaving Amber in tears at the booth, I made my way to the car where my wife, Jean, waited with curiosity evident on her face. So, what did your never wife want to talk about? She asked gently. Exactly what you'd expect, I replied sadly. Amber wants me to help her reconnect with Jennifer. You know what they say, Jean mused. You are the sum total of all your decisions in life. Yeah, that's true, I agreed. Despite everything Amber put me through, I can't help but feel sorry for her. As I drove home, it dawned on me that all the time and energy I spent plotting revenge against Amber had been wasted. She had created her own problems and was living with the consequences every day. Write your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a great day.